Presbyterians prefer their reverends, their doctors of divinity, their modern rabbis. They prefer these men to the Bible. By that I mean that the Westminster Shorter Catechism says that the Bible itself, God's authority, the light which shines in the scriptures, um, the light that shines in the face or the person of Jesus Christ, as 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, um, that this is lesser, this is lesser light um, than the light their ministers can conjure up in their preaching. Because the Westminster Shorter Catechism says, or asks in question 89, how is the word made effectual to salvation? And the answer is, the Spirit of God makes the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. Now, they're not talking about the preaching of the apostles here contained in the Bible. They're not saying that it's in particular the New Testament which converts men today, or it's in particular uh, the book of Romans and Galatians which particularly focus on um, the work of Christ and the gospel. That's not what they're saying, um, because they're putting a dichotomy between reading something and hearing it. Um, so they're referring to their reverends, their modern rabbis, and their doctors of divinity having more influence over Presbyterians than the Bible does. And this is the irony. The irony is they're admitting that it's especially the preaching of their ministers. It's especially their men that get up in a high pulpit and dress themselves up. Uh, that's especially what influences them, and it's not the Bible, and it's not the light of the Scriptures, it's not the authority of God, it's not the beloved Son revealed in the Scriptures, uh, not the eternal Word that is seated in the heavens, as the Psalms say, the Word that does not change, the creative Word that men are born again by, um, and which Paul says that he begot the Corinthians through the Gospel. James says that we're born again by the Word, um, believers are. So it's not this, no. This is not the most important thing for Presbyterians. It's especially the preaching of their doctors of divinity. Now, before I get another comment or a message on YouTube from a devout Presbyterian or follower of a creed or a confession saying that I'm misrepresenting and I'm taking these out of context, let me give you another quote, this time from the confession. Uh, I have to skip down to the underlying bit. I don't have time. Um, it says that we are to receive these councils, the Presbyterian councils, not only for their agreement with the word, but also for the power whereby they are made, as being an ordinance of God appointed thereunto in his word. So we're to bow down to the ministers, doctors of the divinity, and super eminent theologians, um, not only because the Bible says so, um, not only because God, the infallible witness, um, not only because the Holy Spirit, who created it through whom everything was created not only because he testifies that it is so um no because some earthly worm brute beast human um who's barely been alive you know 50 years tells us so um we should <laughs> not just because the eternal god says so but also because man says so um so here we see again that they're revering men they're revering human beings who don't even know God by nature because we're all children of wrath, ignorant, stupid, fools by nature. We're to listen to these fools by nature um, who say in their heart there is no God as if they know more about God um, than the scripture itself. We're to bow to their decrees, their counsels, and so on um, because they're in ordinance and they're so powerful. There was just so many preachers and ministers at that Westminster Assembly in 1646, so I don't know, 300 of them or so, hundreds of them involved. Um, so we just have to bow because there were too many. But following this logic, I suppose it all should go back to Rome. Because I guess the more ministers there are involved, the more power it is, and therefore the more of an ordinance of God it is appointed. Um, but isn't it ironic? <laughs> the next part of this chapter in the Westminster Confession actually says. Um, that all synods and councils have erred. They've all made errors. Um, it's just very ironic they haven't to put it straight up to this point. But you have to wonder, where are they getting this idea from that man can have any authority in the realm of religion? That man can know anything by God to tell another man that either the Bible doesn't say um, 
you know, or can be deducted from the Bible? Can we have something, other sources of knowledge other than the scripture? Well, Westminster Confession, chapter 1, first line of it says, The light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable. And the larger catechism in question 2, How does it appear that there is a God? says, The very light of nature in man and the works of God declare plainly that there is a God. So, according to the catechism, the larger catechism, there is in man already truth. People already have knowledge of God deep down, embedded in their conscience. And so you hear people like Piper saying we have an inner voice screaming out to us to accept Christ. Um, that's one consequence, is you start directing people, listen to your inner voice, listen to your inner voice, um, because apparently there's truth down there by nature. The other consequence is obviously that you start revering men. Um, once you start thinking that people by nature are, have truth and knowledge, well, you think, I should listen to man. Man by nature has truth and knowledge, so there's nothing wrong with giving an ear to another man in the matters of religion without testing it by the scripture. Um, because if man by nature has truth and knowledge, you don't have. You can be relaxed. You're like, well, he's got truth and knowledge. Um, the Westminster Catechism says the very light of nature is in man and is revealing God, so you start paying less attention to the Bible because the Bible's now only another source. Um, ask yourself, like, who, who will pay more attention to the Bible? A guy who thinks the sky reveals God, my, my heart reveals God, and the scripture reveals God? Or another guy who says, it's the Bible alone, it's by faith, we know the world's refrain by the word of God. Hebrews 11 verse 3. Who says that the world by wisdom knew not God, and I'm no better than the Gentiles, so I can't figure out God either, except by the scripture. Because fools say in their heart, there is no God, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So unless I believe and fear and revere the scripture, I can't have any knowledge of God at all. That man will not be paying attention to synods and councils and all the modern rabbis. The fact of the matter is, the only God we believe in by nature is the devil. 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies in the evil one, or evil, the wicked one. 1 Kings 18.27 Elijah taunted them and said Call with a loud voice for he is a god for he is meditating or pursuing or on a journey it may be he is asleep or must be awakened and the things that Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons so the god that the Philistines were worshipping was Satan himself or demons or um, false gods and idols are all the same thing it's just a delusion of Satan as Galatians 4 8 to 9 says but then indeed not knowing God you served as slaves to the ones by nature not being gods but now knowing God so not knowing God is a state of all men by nature um, being lying in the wicked one believing delusions of Satan and then knowing God is conversion so in actual fact the evidence of a believer's salvation or the grounds for his assurance is actually the Bible itself or the existence of God itself will give the believer sufficient like all the comfort and assurance he'll ever need because prior to his conversion he didn't know, he did not know God at all according to these four verses so therefore after being converted um, knowing simply what God is who he is his infinite love his infinite justice his infinite holiness um, will be that to that believer proof that he's saved um, because before he didn't know God, so now knowing God is the evidence, um, the greatness of God, the glory of God, how his sovereignty, his justice, um, his demand for perfection. These are all evidences to the believer he's saved because knowing these things is solely a gift the elect get. So the act, in actual fact, the evidence of salvation we see is the evidence of God's existence. They can't be separated. So if someone's doubting their salvation, they're an atheist because according to these verses, to know God himself, to know who he is, what he's done in Christ, um, is eternal life. So those people who doubt that Christ's work is enough and so on, or that they're believing or they're not sure, um, they're clearly evidencing that they don't know who God is because the evidence that someone is saved is God's existence. Um, so therefore, to doubt you're saved is to doubt God's existence. It's like saying, like, you can know a person um, but then go and doubt that you actually have met the person so someone who's not sure if they know, they know God um, they're not sure if they know Christ they're actually atheists because they're doubting whether or not God and Christ exist